Greetings in the precious name of Jesus. Once again, we come into a day that we have never seen before, a day that shall never again come into existence. Thus, we are encouraged to give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good and his mercy does endure throughout the ages. Seeing this is the last Sunday in the month, the month has rapidly come to an end. And no doubt, thus we will experience as the months come on forward and the year goes toward its end. But we thank God for this month and the great things he is doing and we trust that God has blessed you in this new year and is yet doing great things in your life. Today, by the help of the Lord, we shall go to a passage of scripture in a personal letter that's private that Apostle Paul wrote to Philemon. And here in this one chapter, he addresses a, a very great concern for a particular individual. One thing we come to find out that, as we said on last Sunday, that God directs us so that he is a God of specificity. He puts us in the right time and at the right place. In the book of Philemon, chapter 1, which is needless to say, in verses 10 and 11, they read as such, I am entreating you concerning my child whom I beget in my bonds. Verse 11, Onesimus, who once was useless to you, yet now is useful to you as well as to me, whom I send back to you. And all that believe God's word to be inerrant and infallible, we ask you just to give God the praise by saying amen and amen. Out of this particular passage of scripture, we wish to lift a single word for this theme, Onesimus. One word, just the gentleman's name, Onesimus. And for a vibe of Ose, we wish you to consider these words and utilize them after God has spoken to your heart to make you understand that God is ever with you. Our Bible will say is, I am no longer useless. I am no longer useless. Shall we pray? Father, we bless you today and we thank you for being great in our lives. For it's been you and no one else that has blessed us, kept us and delivered us, brought us into this day, causing us to be able to hear a word knowing that your word brings deliverance, knowing that your word can heal, that it can uplift, strengthen. It can do what no one else can do. And we thank you. Lord, unctionize thy servant and cause every ear to hear this word, to understand that you have blessed them, lift them up and cause them no longer to be useless in the kingdom of your dear son. In Jesus' name, amen. Onesimus. All humans, are humans really rational creatures? And do creatures actually determine choice via a process of reasoning? Uh, these creatures that we're talking about, and we must admit, everyone, that there are creatures many but we are speaking of humankind now. And when we speak of that creature here in this exordium, we ask ourselves when it comes to being rational, uh, is the creature sensible? Does it exhibit reasoning or making a choice that displays the use of all available information for the best outcome? That's what we talked about being rational. We use the word logical, which means 
the assembling of information as to a correct and valid reasoning. We may use the word sane to talk about or to be synonymous with rational. And sane means simple, good mental health, meaning to us no apparent mental disorders. Now, the reason that I say no apparent is because we all know that there is something wrong with all of us. Every 7.2 billion persons upon this earth, as we push the 8 billion number mark, there is something inherently wrong with all. Although it's true, as Paul said, it's not wise, but we measure ourselves by ourselves. So we consider that someone else is less of a mental health than us based upon what we can or cannot do. But let's take it from the beginning. Genesis 3 and verse 32, 22 says, And the Lord God says, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. Now, we must admit that we have seen how God speaks of the creation of mankind. And so the Bible tells us he formed him of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a conscious being. He became an entity whereby blood is the life, the soul, this is Leviticus 17, verse 11, and the soul is in the blood. In other words, our living is in our blood. And so the reference is not to a change in body when the Lord said the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, but he is speaking of a consciousness and awareness. He's not speaking of spirit for we have realized and read that both body and spirit were already existing. However, them two coming together, it brought a consciousness to the man who had been formed from the ground. He had no idea that he would not be able to perform once he had violated God's raw law to him because it tells us that God had told him that, listen, the day that you eat, you're going to certainly die. In other words, you're going to be removed from the place of immortality by way of the tree of life. And thus the mortality that man had, it then sought to bring him to his end. It tells us it was the capacity to rationalize between a contrast of good and evil when he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Notice the tree. It was only one tree, and I know we always speak of most times it being evil, but this particular tree, it actually allowed man to become aware of a contrast. Now, one of the things we would definitely love to say and, uh, and make known to you, which you know is a traditional era of Eden. Now, because now man's knowledge is relative based upon contrast, we can look back on it now and see what the word of God says. Number one, Adam lacked the element of apprehending God's goodness. It was no way that he could apprehend God's goodness. Let's take a look at the scriptures. And so we find nothing written about him being appreciative, thankful, any joy, or even any worship. Uh, Adam had all of this good all around him, but he was not conscious of it because he simply did not know evil. Remember, this is true. The possession of good does not mean that it is known or realized. Look at the proverb that we have, we have now, and we say that people didn't know or don't know what they have until they lose it. 
Well, it is true here with Adam. Perfect health, an abundance of food, no disease or famine. To realize those types of things. For if there was a disease, then he would understand what perfect health was about. He would give thanks unto the Lord for it. Uh, an abundance of food he had. Every tree, every tree, the Bible said, was given to him to eat. There was no famine. So how could he realize that there was an abundance of food, the good that is? Had Adam and Eve known the good, that they would have treasured God's goodness and would not have forfeited by eating of the tree. Now, this is simply true. You must realize that here is Adam and Eve in the garden. They have no idea of what good is like because there is no contrast. This you must keep in mind. Man's knowledge is relative. Our knowledge is based upon a contrast. For how can I know up if there is not down? How can I know left if there is not right? How can I know whether or not there's darkness if there is no light? For us, there must be a contrast in order for us to have knowledge of it. So Adam and Eve are here in what we call this perfect place, but yet again, it lacks something that Adam cannot give God the praise. He cannot thank God. He cannot be appreciative. That's why many times you find that, in other words, growing up as young people, many times we don't really know what we have in a home life or even with friends, and sometimes he said, except they are gone. Then we understand. Well, the lack of the thing that caused Adam to disobey God was the element that became Watch this, the ability for him to do what he could not do before, and that was to give God the glory. In other words, we read nothing of Adam ever praising God. We read nothing of worship. We read nothing of him being thankful. It is simply him being there could not and would not give God the glory and the honor that's due him. But look what happens. It is gets the praise and the glory. This is so important because when we begin to look at what God has done, we must admit the wisdom of God is past finding out. In other words, when you look at what Paul said, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. That's why you must realize Adam did not fall down, but in the future, God has a blessing that is greater than Eden. I know someone says, let's go back to Eden, but that's not what God is doing. Paul said he is taking us higher than that. He is placing us not in this terra firma, but in a celestial position whereby we are above principalities and powers and such angels that now exist. Well, we must admit that the questions presented in the exordium also demands the observation of at least two rudimentary words for consideration. To at least a attempt an intelligent response to the question. Number one is the word capable. Number two is the word ability. When we speak of these two words, speaking of capable or capacity, it suggests a potential is perceived whether it's innate or it has been acquired. Listen, the coach, he sees the neophyte out there running and he observes that the young man in the manner that he is running without any education or any development, he sees that it can be cultivated into something great or great 
greater that there is then. This is, he says, the young man is capable or have potential to become great. Let's say when you go to a building and you see whether it is a place of an auditorium, or it could even be a store. They always have on the permit, and it's called the use of occupancy. It has the occupant but capacity. It means that the room can hold X amount of people, although it may only be 15 people in the room or the building, but the on the wall, it says 500 people. It has the capacity, is capable of holding 500 people. When we come to the word able ability, it suggests that there exists is an innate or acquired faculty to perform. In other words, the Hebrew boys take us there, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they tell the king, they said, listen, whom we worship, he is able to deliver us. But they also were cognizant of the fact that they not knowing the will of God, but determined that he is going to be there, God said that even if he does not, yet he is able to do it and we will serve him. In other words, the lack of performance is not indicative of inability with God and even so many times with man because sometimes a person has the ability to do something, they just will or refuse not to do it. Uh, but when it comes to God, I love it how it is true uh, that God gets the glory that he deserves. Uh, for Jude said, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Uh, what a joy and a gladness it is to know uh, that our God is able, has the ability to do uh, even what we ourselves cannot do. Uh, so the failure of Adam in the garden. It succumbed all mankind to an inability to give God the glory he deserves. It is true that the capability or the potential was there, is in us, but how to perform it was absent. Listen, even Paul says this. He says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing thing, but to will, uh, he said, is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Uh, this goes to share with us that mankind is capable uh, of doing something because his will, he says, my will, uh, but I don't have the ability to do it. Uh, many times there are plenty of people uh, who are actually trying to do something, uh, but they don't have the ability to do it. Uh, Paul said it in the 22nd verse of the seventh chapter, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. In other words, he lets us know that it's there. I'm capable of thinking it, of willing it, but I have no power or ability to bring it forward. Because death is in the body, it vitiates mankind, causing him the inability to perform even when he knows what is good and wills to do it, yet one cannot do it. Paul thus says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And so it is death that's in us that causes us, mankind, not to be able to serve God like he desires. Desires. Uh, notice in Romans chapter 5, the Bible says, uh, he says that Adam sinned and not sin passed on. He said, but death 
was passed on to every man. Then it goes on to say, by this death, it is the reason why we, mankind, missed the mark or sinned. You are not born with sin. The Bible never says that. You are born with the death sentence, and the death sentence is less or the antithesis to life. Why do you think when Jesus came, he said, I I come that you may have life uh, and that more abundantly. It is the bringing in life into our being uh, that gives us the power that we can overcome death uh, the same as Jesus did when he rose from the grave. Uh, thus man becomes the creature that has the potential to be rational uh, but is limited in his ability to acquire and digest all available information for every topic. In other words, we are rational, but we make choices based upon the information we have. And not only that, even once we acquire information, we don't have all of it. That's why our judgment, we call it in philosophy, a frame of reference. It is only as much as you can fit into the frame uh, that you will find the picture can be observed. Uh, many times you look at a picture, you take it out, folk have folded the sides of the picture. Uh, and when you unfold it, take it out the frame, the picture is larger than the frame. Uh, but when it was in the frame, uh, all you saw was the frame of reference. Uh, uh, yes, it is many times our judgment, though it may not be accurate, it is based upon the frame of reference, the knowledge that we have acquired and we have digested. And so that makes every choice, decision that we performed, it's relative. It's never absolute. Many times we even say among ourselves, had I known, I would have done or chose otherwise. Uh, this brings us to our lesson in Philemon, where we find a man by the name of Onesimus. Uh, he was a runaway slave uh, and that possibly was a native of Colosh. Uh, here the Bible tells us Paul is in his several home uh, here in prison uh, in Rome. Uh, this man has run away and come to Rome uh, where he can hide out for whatever he did that caused him to make the choice to run away from his master. This is very important, this personal letter that Paul writes because it's private. It's not like the rest of the epistles he wrote, whereby it went to Timothy, but to all, where he told Timothy, teach this to other men who are able to teach. Or he assented to one of the churches or the ecclesias. Here the Bible tells us this is a private personal letter that he sends by Onesimus to take back to Philemon. But notice this letter is important. And if those today who are in Christendom would adhere to it, we'll find out that we can learn a lot from God's word, not simply just in the ecclesiastical realm, but in the social life. Paul says here as he is preaching, it doesn't tell us how he arrests the attention of Onesimus, but somehow or another, Onesimus comes in the earshot of Paul's preaching, and the Bible tells us in this letter that he becomes a part of the body of Christ. I know many 
cried about Paul leaving. And he says, why weep ye? He said, intend to break my heart. He says, for if God has called for me to go to Rome, he says, then I'm going to Rome and that shall no harm befall me. Well, timing is the wisdom of God. You have wondered many times why you made the choice that subjected you to an outcome that either is not likable to you or that has reduced you in some way or manner. But if you can just stay right there where God has put you, you'll find out that the timing of God is nothing like it, for God will bring you into deliverance. That's why I believe the psalmist says, just wait on the Lord and be of good courage. God will give you strength to hold on. And so it goes on and tell us that for whatever reason, Onesimus abandoned Philemon, although it's not shared precisely. Maybe he stole something. Maybe he was paid and he didn't continue his duty for what he was paid. That's a method of theft. But listen to what Paul says. Paul began to write this letter and say, he said, listen, Onesimus now, he has become a part of the body of Christ. And there is a fiduciary responsibility to Philemon, to one now that is a brother in Christ. This is so important, this letter. Notice Paul did not write a commandment and say, listen, I want you to emancipate him. But Paul instructed him that he is now a fellow brother in the body of Christ. And he shared with him like he wrote to the book in Romans. And he said, we don't need the law that tells us to love thy neighbor as thyself. We don't need the law to tell us thou shalt not kill. He said, you don't need the law to tell you thou shalt not cover your neighbor's possession because in Christ the love of God has been shared abroad in our hearts by his spirit and by that love it causes us to do the things of God. Paul's letter confirms that believers everywhere should be abolitionists, not only in word, but in action. The Bible lets us know here that you don't have to tell somebody, command them that you order emancipate the slave, but the love of God, it comes with his spirit. And the Bible says, it. This is what they shall know you, for they shall know you by the love you have one toward the other. Well, we go back to Adam. Man was not designed to be useless because you see the name Onesimus, it means profitable. But somehow or another, he became useless to Philemon because he ran away. But now Paul writes back and say, he is now useful, not only to me, but to you. Well, consider what God has done in the word, his creation of Adam and mankind. We were not designed to be useless in the worship of God. Listen, just like Adam left his place of fellowship with God. Uh, in the sense of fellowship, uh, man became a useless to God, uh, but looked like it was with Onesimus. Uh, the grace of 
Christ has secured man a place that is greater than Eden. I don't want to go back to Eden, but I want to be able to go forth and see what the end shall be. For Paul has declared he has delivered us from the powers of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. It's a celestial place and has set us, he wrote to Ephesians uh, and said, set us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Uh, I know some believe uh, that Eden is where it is, uh, but I share with you the psalmist says, uh, he said, at first God made man uh, a little lower than the angels, uh, but Paul has declared uh, that God is now raising him up, uh, taking him to a place that's beyond on the angels uh, for God's glory uh, and for God's praise. Uh, you have become emancipated uh, from the power of self by Jesus Christ. Uh, you, my friend, uh, must look at it. Maybe uh, you feel like Onesimus today uh, and you feel like uh, that I have fallen short of the grace of God. Uh, you realize uh, that you are in a death state uh, and yes death is going to catch us all one day uh, but listen what the psalmist said uh, I shall not die uh, but live and declare the works of the Lord uh, when God emancipates you from yourself uh, you'll find out that your thinking is a different uh, it'll be like Paul says uh, for we ought to have the mind of Christ uh, well maybe you haven't received the Spirit of God uh, unto salvation today, uh, but God has ordained that you hear the word uh, at the right time and the right place. Uh, it wasn't there with Philemon uh, that Onesimus was to hear the word, uh, and that's why many can't understand uh, the choices that they make. Uh, but if you read Jeremiah chapter 10, uh, he said, Oh Lord, uh, it's not in man to direct his steps. Uh, in other words, uh, God is working things in your life. Uh, yes, it seems as if uh, that things are going wrong. Uh, look like things are going south in your life, uh, but God has not forgotten you uh, and God has not let you go. Uh, for the Bible said, ye are in his hands. Uh, and nothing can pluck you out of him. Uh, you feel like uh, you have left your place uh, for some reason or the other in Christ. Uh, however, God has a word uh, that will cause you to return uh, and become greater than you were. Uh, you want to shine for Jesus? Uh, then there must be some darkness uh, of tests and trials and tribulations in your life. Uh, remember, uh, the stars are no less luminous uh, during the day than at night. Uh, however, uh, they need the light to reveal their brilliance. Uh, you want to give God the praise, uh, but there has not been no misery in your life. Uh, there hasn't been something for you to praise God for. Uh, when you talk about love uh, is revealed by one's knowledge of hate. Uh, strength is not known uh, where weakness does not exist. Uh, wisdom relies on folly to prove its dignity. Uh, yes, my friend, uh, we were once useless, uh, but God has called us to salvation uh, by grace through faith. Uh, he says that we are delivered uh, and that not of ourselves, uh, but it is the gift of God. Uh, you may feel like Onesimus today, uh, but listen, uh, you can say I am no longer useless uh, for God has called you with a plan uh, for the 
Bible said who he foreknow, God calls him. And who God calls, he justifies. And whom God justifies, he glorifies. Listen, God is working in your life. Yes, things went south. Yes, you made the wrong choice. But you won't be able to give God the praise. You won't be able to worship him like Adam couldn't do before he ate of the tree. And the very thing that he lacked uh, it's the thing that calls him uh, to be able to give God the praise. Uh, it's after this you find out uh, that Adam was able to worship God. Uh, your worship uh, is uh, based upon your contrast uh, of what you know or don't know about God. Uh, so you can say as you go through the week, uh, I'm no longer useless, uh, but though I'm in the lion's den, uh, God has a purpose. Uh, though I'm being prepared to be thrown in the furnace, uh, God is able to deliver me. Uh, it's not our thinking. Uh, it's not our greatness. Uh, and Paul said, it's not of him that runneth. Uh, it's not of him that willeth, uh, but of God that has mercy. Uh, we ought to be shouting and dancing for joy. Uh, our mouths open with a praise. Uh, our steps and hands move in uh, to the glory of God. Uh, for God uh, has made Onesiphorus, uh, he has made him profitable, uh, exactly what his name says. Uh, and you, my friend, uh, still uh, are the son of God through Adam, uh, and God has called us uh, to give him the glory. Uh, listen, uh, Today, there are many that feel like Onesimus. Uh, they feel like things are going wrong. Uh, for whatever reason, they have run away from God instead of run to God. Uh, but God has his word somewhere. Uh, there's a Paul in prison, uh, and he is ready to give a word as you intersect with that time. He's a God of specificity, timing is of God. And so the Bible tells us God has a time for everything and a time for your deliverance is here. Yes, you feel useless. Yes, there is no use of you where you are and what you're in now. But if you just wait on the Lord, be of good courage for God has a word that's going to intersect your life and cause you to be useful, not only to man, but to God. Our time is up and we pray the blessings of the Lord upon you because there are Onesimuses out here and you may be one, but God's love is towards you and you shall be by his word useful, not only to God, but to man. Shall we pray? Father, we bless you today. We thank you for the blessing that you have bestowed upon us. For great things have you done, whereby we are glad. Lord, we thank you for those that shall hear this word, those that hear it time and time again, that the blessings of God be upon them, causing them to realize and to understand that though we are rational creatures, we have the potential, but we are not able to give you the glory except by your spirit. Bless, Lord, right now and cause your spirit to be upon them as they seek you and understand that you have called us to usefulness in this day, in this age, and at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed and enjoy the week.